Time to talk about saliva. Now that we're in digestive PowerPoint number three, saliva technically known as spit. No, saliva is a technical name. What does it do? Lots of things. Moistens food, begins starch and fat digestion. There are enzymes in saliva. Cleanses the teeth, inhibits bacteria, and binds food together into a bolus. So that big lump that you swallow, that's technically called a bolus. It's a hypotonic solution. That means it has fewer solutes than most of your ECF. It's 99.5% water, all right, and then some solutes. Salivary amylase begins starch digestion right there in the mouth. You start breaking down starch. Lingual lipase digests fat, but it, although it's secreted by salivary glands, it doesn't actually start to work until it hits your stomach, where it's activated by the low pH from the hydrochloric acid. You should look on your exam three topic list sheet. I think it's on the back side. I don't have it in front of me right now. There's a, uh, there's a heading called secretions. There are a lot of secretions for the digestive system. I recommend you make a table or a chart. You'll need four columns. Column one will be the name of the secretion. Column two will be where it's secreted. Column three is where it actually does its job. And number four what it actually does. So for example, column one would say salivary amylase, column two secreted in the mouth, column three works in the mouth, column four digests starch. Then column one, lingual lipase, column two secreted in the mouth, column three goes to work in the stomach, number four digests fats. Okay. Mucus, that aids in swallowing, makes them remember, keep it sliding. Lysosome kills bacteria, IgA, remember, the immunoglobulin, the one that was found in breast milk, other bodily secretions, tears, sweat, so on, and saliva. Electrolytes, yeah, and bicarbonate, sure. Saliva, 6.8 to 7.0, so it's slightly acidic, but basically neutral. And there you see, and I don't want to take a long time in this, but I think it's worth it. There's Pavlov, one of Pavlov's dogs. You may have heard of Pavlov. He took a Psych 101 class. Pavlov actually started out studying digestion. He was a physiologist, and he was interested in, um, he, he hypothesized that different foods would cause different amounts of saliva. So he had these dogs, and he was an expert surgeon. He took the parotid duct from the parotid salivary gland, which you can see in the diagrams that we have, rerouted it to outside the mouth and collected the saliva in a tube. And then what he did was he would like put meat in the dog's mouth or put vegetables in the dog's mouth to see how much saliva there was. Well, he started to work on that and he ran into a big problem. The damn dog started salivating before he put the food into their mouth. And Pavlov thought, damn! So he, he called that the psychic reflex, and he said he, he decided he would set aside his, di his digestive work to try to figure out the psychic reflex so he could get back to studying digestion. Well, he never got back to it. He spent the rest of his life studying the psychic reflex, which we now call classical conditioning. He won the Nobel Prize in medicine for it. And by the way, Pavlov was very good to his dogs. After the experiment was over, he fixed the surgery. He restored it to its original thing original location and then he had a big farm in the country where all the dogs ran free and played and had fun for the rest of their happy little doggy lives and there you see Pavlov's dog and there's Pavlov at the strip club salivary glands okay small intrinsic glands we've talked about these a few times already three of them all together parotid submandibular and sublingual parotid by your ear subling sublingual under the tongue submandibular under the mandible and there you see the Sonoran toad that you have right around here. Those big lumps on the back that the arrows are pointing to, those are the parotoid glands. Similar. Those are the ones that produce hallucinogens and led to the phenomenon of toad licking to get high. Salivation. Okay, you make one to one and a half liters of saliva a day. Think of a quart of Gatorade. One or one and a half quarts of Gatorade, roughly. Um, it only comes from your blood. Um... And food stimulates receptors that signal um, salivatory nuclei in the medulla and pons. So the presence of food causes the medulla and the, the, the sight of food, the smell of food, any of that, 
will cause the brain to start making you salivate. Parasympathetic saliva is thin but rich in enzymes, whereas sympathetic is thick and sticky, a lot more mucus. All right, think about the people who are nervous. You know, you get nervous, your mouth sticks together. That's why I have the glass of water at every podium. Okay, parasympathetic, thin, but lots of enzymes. Sympathetic, thicker, stickier, mostly mucus. And um, again, anything, uh, anything about food, the sight of food, the smell of food, anything like that. I mean, think you got cats, the sound of the can opener will bring them running, okay? And don't mix the words up, salvation versus salivation. Salvation, praise the Lord. Salivation, praise the Lord, food. My mom was a devout Catholic. I remember one time she asked me to do grace at the dinner table. I said, good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. And I had to go to my room without dinner. The esophagus, all right, straight muscular tube, 25 to 30 centimeters long. So, yeah, 10 inches, 12 inches, something like that. Skeletal muscle in the upper part, smooth in the bottom. And that's important, actually, because it means that the upper part, you can control things. So if you start to swallow something and decide you don't want to, the voluntary skeletal muscle can force it back out. Once it gets part way down, though, it's going the rest of the way because it's nothing but smooth muscle there. Goes from the pharynx to the cardiac region of the stomach, passes through the esophageal hiatus in the diaphragm. The lower esophageal sphincter, LES, I talked about that in the lab PowerPoint, closes in order to prevent acid reflux. You don't want acid splashing back up. That's a problem. You can actually start digesting your own esophagus. Very unpleasant. Swallowing, technically deglutition. Muscular contractions coordinated by the medulla and the pons. We're talking about motor signals coming out through cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11, which you studied in 201. Uh, glossopharyngeal, vagus, and hypoglossal. You can swallow upside down due to peristalsis. So, in other words, it's a muscular contraction that will force food to go. It doesn't just need gravity. The buccal phase, that's where stuff gets in. You collect the food. You push it into your oropharynx with your tongue. Pharyngeal esophageal phase, soft palate rises, blocks the nasopharynx so food doesn't go up into your nasal cavity. Infrahyoid muscle lifts the larynx, epiglottis folds down so you don't swallow food into your trachea. And then the pharyngeal constrictors push the bolus down the esophagus. Liquids get to the bottom in two seconds, food can take maybe eight. Lower esophageal sphincter relaxes automatically, smooth muscle in the presence of food. There you go, doing the keg stand. Yes, you can swallow upside down. Stomach, okay, mechanically breaks up food, liquefies, and begins chemical digestion. So it's both mechanical and chemical. Chemical. The stomach is a muscle. It contracts. It mashes the food, but it's also full of acid. The soupy mixture is called chyme. It's kind of like a very thin soup. That's what the stomach produces, okay? does not absorb a lot of nutrients, exceptions to aspirin, some lipid-soluble drugs, but... Very little absorption takes place in the stomach. You should ask yourself right now, because I've talked about this a few times, where does absorption mostly take place? That's right, the small intestine. And there you go, a pregnant woman, little baby's foot, kicking to get out. I actually got to see that on my wife. when my, And it was the kid that I would have thought would do that, who was the one who did do that. And that girl, that's freaky. Um, you can see the lower end of her rib cage. There's her um, rectus abdominis. Um, and uh, you see her iliac crest. I, I would not date her, even if I was back dating. I don't know. That's I maybe. Well, we could talk. Nice um, actual physical picture of the stomach. You know, match that up with the diagrams. We've talked about this enough, and I don't want to make this uh, PowerPoint too long, so I'm going to move on. Stomach muscular sac, 50 milliliters at rest. That's like two shot glasses. Four liters, that's over a gallon. Okay, so it can expand massively. Now, we said before that the GI tract had two layers of muscle, circular and longitudinal, where the stomach is special. It has a special third layer of oblique. And that's because the stomach is one that really, really mashes up the food. The stomach, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to see the cadaver, but I normally have people hold the cadaver stomach. Oh, my God, it's a powerful muscle. J-shape, lesser and greater curvatures. Um, cardiac region, right by the esophagus. Okay, fundus the domed portion on the top, the body is the main part, the pyloric, that's where it leads into the duodenum, okay? Pylorus opening to the duodenum, 
There is a sphincter muscle there. It's a smooth muscle, not under uh, voluntary control. It opens when food is ready to move from the stomach into the duodenum. And there you go, a child's stomach. Little tiny bit for meals, huge amount for desserts, some for snacks. There's that little new, that little particle for new foods, a little bit for veggies, pennies and small objects, and then the part for extra dessert. Okay, um, so parasympathetic and sympathetic, all right, sympathetic inhibits digestion, parasympathetic activates digestion, okay? All blood from the stomach and from the intestines enters the hepatic portal vein, which you've heard about so many times now. That's so that it goes into the liver, where the liver can steal all the nutrients before it dumps it through the hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava, and then it goes back to the heart. So once again, those four layers of the digestive tract, the mucosa. In the mucosa are the tubular gl glands called gastric pits. All right? Muscularis externa has three layers for the stomach. Again, unlike other um, the rest of the GI tract, an extra layer of muscle in the stomach because it really is a powerful muscle that smashes up. So on that left-hand diagram, look, see the rugi, the ridges, the wrinkles on the stomach, and then you can see the pits going down in, and we're going to talk about the pits in an upcoming slide, okay? So here you go. The submucosal plexus controls secretion of what, and the myenteric plexus controls what? Is it mucus and enzymes, mucus and hormones, mucus peristalsis, enzymes and hormones peristalsis, enzymes and hormones mucus? Pause the video, make sure you can answer, then take a look. Here we go. Yes, submucosa is for mucus. Keep it sliding. My enteric is for the muscles. Keep it moving. Here's Jump Up Point at the Grand Canyon. Once again, one of those places, only four-wheel drive. I've never seen anybody else here. There's my chair, my tequila of course. Notice how I face the opening of the tent away from the wall of the canyon. I don't want to drink a bunch of tequila, wake up drunk in the middle of the night to pee and walk over the edge. I'll see you again in digestive PowerPoint number four.